And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the table? Every week, we like to take this look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. Uh, so this past week, I hosted another game night at Easy Mode, which is an eSports lounge that opened up in the last couple months here in Windsor. Um, one of the things that I really like about gaming at Easy Mode so far is that we are getting a lot of new gamers out. I think a big part of that is the fact that it's a video gaming lounge in general. Um, this has included ex experienced players, who I've never seen out at public play events before, as well as people who are completely new to hobby board gaming. And this past weekend, we had actually had a good mix of both. Yeah, you know, it's been great to see this new venue with a different crowd growing and evolving to become a real solid part of the Windsor gaming landscape. I have a feeling that uh, Easy Mode is probably uh, a bit of a neutral territory where this way mm -hmm. people don't have to sort of uh, state their preference for one of the two gaming stores, uh, which also hold events. Yeah, plus it's not gaming at a store. One of the problems with gaming at a store is people feel obliged to spend money, right? Like, which I actually support. You should support the venue that's hosting you. That's a heck of a lot easier when you can support them by buying a pound of Walkerville beer instead of buying a $40 board game. Now, due to having so many new gamers show up at Easy Mode over the last couple of weeks, I've started bringing more and more gateway games to the event, which obviously ties in well with last week's episode where we were talking about modern gateway games. And most of what I brought, actually, last week, I kind of took the pile that I set up behind our uh, podcast here. I basically kind of scooped that up and brought it with me to Easy Mode. Now, I did bring one new one, though. This is something I managed to pick up at Origins, and I thought it would be a good gateway game for an event like this, and that is Tower of Madness. Uh, this is published by Smirk and Dagger Games, designed by Kurt Covert himself, who's the, also the owner of the company. Uh, it was released last year. Uh, I do remember seeing it at Origins, but I think the actual release to the public was Gen Con 2018. I did get a review copy off Kurt at Origins this past year, and I taught and played Tower of Madness a total of three times on Saturday. Now, I got to admit, when I first saw it at Origins, uh, it's a tower with a bunch of things stuck into it, and marbles put in the top. Yes, it's basically kerplunk. Like, that's literally what the tower part of the game is. Now, when I saw it at Origins, I thought that was it. I was just like, what, you're going to pull tentacles and, and whoever gets the last marble wins or something? Or maybe the different marble marble colors matter? Uh, okay, I don't know. Let's kind of get mimicky, but sure. Um, I got to say, I'm very happy that it is much more than that. Um, to be honest, the tower is really a small but important part of the game. Because Tower of Madness is actually a push-your-luck dice game. And it's only when you fail in the dice rolling mechanic that you end up pulling tentacles from the tower and deal with any marbles that fall out. Well, it may be a small part of the game, but as we've said many times, that kind of table presence from a game aspect cannot be underestimated. Yeah, this one looks good. Uh, for those of you who do show up on, on the 24th, you'll get to see this one. It's definitely going to be out at Extra Light. Now, one of the things I did like about the game was I actually thought all the marbles were going to be horrible, and they're not, which actually kind of fits pretty well with the theme. Like, there are red madness marbles, and if you get four of those, you do go insane. And there are three green Cthulhu marbles, and if all of those come out, you do lose. But all the other ones are not only positive, but they're also more numerous. So you kind of want to pull, and you're avoiding madness. Like, it does really tie in. So for those following along, Madness, bad, Great Old One, bad, other outcomes, good. Yeah, pretty much. That's that's every Cthulhu game in five minutes. <laughs> They're not even in five seconds. Um, I, I'm just impressed, really, that this is more of a gamer's game than than I expected. I, I thought it was going to be kind of a cheap gimmick, right? Uh, but at the same time, I am disappointed by a few things. For one, there's not a lot of tension from the tower. Like, it's kind of neat, but... We found that most of the time you pull and nothing happens. And then when we do get a marble to fall, like we'll get like one or two and then like six will fall at once, um, which is kind of weird. And the other thing that especially Deanna didn't like is when you pass on your investigation, you've supposedly succeeded. But the player who gets the points is the person who succeeded the best. So you passed, but you didn't get enough points. So you do nothing. Like you're just like, oh, I passed. Yeah, uh, yay? Like, you're almost better off failing because then you at least get to pull out a tentacle. Um, 
now we have played three times and no one's gone insane yet. Like it hasn't even gotten close. No one's even gotten three marbles, let alone four. So like I haven't even gotten to experience that part of the game. Well, arguably some gamers might, uh, never mind. Uh. <laughs> uh, one other interesting thing that came up too is um, at the end of the night, Deanna's like, oh, we should sit down and try a two player. And I'm like, all right, great. We'll sit down, try a two player. And then I grab the rule book, and there's a number of starting spell cards you get. Or no, no, it's a number of locations. There's a number of locations you put in the location deck to explore uh, based on the number of players. And nowhere in there is two players. So I grabbed the box and looked, and sure enough, it says three to five players. Huh, that's kind of weird. So we, we tried it anyway. We're like, eh, we're here. Let's do it. And you know what? It worked. Like, it worked perfectly fine. Like, there didn't seem to be any problem playing two players. Actually, Deanna preferred our two-player play to the earlier five player play. So I find it really odd that the game says plays three to five and I don't know why. Well, I, I wouldn't have pegged this as a game for Deanna in the first place. So no. perhaps minimizing it down might just have been what the doctor ordered. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Now as for other people's thoughts, cause I did play with a, a couple different groups at the event. Uh, the first game we played with all five players, uh, literally everyone was like, eh, it's okay. Uh, one of the players specifically thought that this seems like a good game that didn't have enough play testing. Um, one of the complaints that came up too was not enough components to track everything. Cause sometimes you'd be doing the die rolls and it'd be like the first person to roll five of something, but there was no way to track five cause you passed the dice. So that was a little weird. Um, I, I just, it went okay. Now later in the night I taught a second group and it was a complete opposite. Like the couple of the players playing this absolutely loved the game. Uh, one of them even had their phone out trying to see if they could buy a copy by the end of the night. So, okay. Two totally different views on it. And well, the third play was the one with Deanna and I, and actually that was quite fun. Uh, right now though, I got to say, uh, don't, I don't rush out to buy this, uh, but I'm not going to talk anyone out of it. If you think it sounds cool, go for it. But like right now, I think this is a try before you buy. Well, and there's nothing wrong with that. So go out and talk to your local FLGS and see if they're interested and willing to run a demo night for the game. All right, up next is uh, King of the Dice. So this is another game picked up at Origins 2019. Uh, this is one that's from Haba, and I picked it up to play with my girls mainly, my kids. Uh, I have played it with Big G. I played it with my oldest, and so far she's dug it. I haven't had a chance to play it with our youngest yet. She was... Uh, over visiting grandma when we were playing. Uh, one of the things I was curious about with this game is if adults would actually enjoy it, something I wanted to check out before giving out the review. Now, I had a feeling it would be a great gateway game for non-hobby gamers, and I got to test that theory because I brought the game out on Saturday. So after we played Tower of Madness with that first group that kind of had a man experience, three of the five players moved to another table with me, and I taught King of the Dice because I thought this would be amusing and tie in well because it's another push your luck dice game. So in King of the Dice, players are rolling a set of six dice, trying to match the patterns on various citizen cards that are laid out in the center of the table. Now each citizen is worth points and above each citizen is a territory card. Now the citizens and the territories have colors and if they happen to match, if they line up in the right place, you get to collect both cards. So there's a little bit of fore planning for that. Uh, the dice themselves are D6s numbered 1 to 6, but in addition to that, they also have colored sides. So there's red, green, and blue, and there is literally an equal number of each. So there's like two red ones and two blue ones and two green ones, and so on for all the other numbers. Now, the patterns required to take the citizens are all unique, and they include all kinds of different stuff. I'm not going to get into all of them, but like... Uh, whatever, uh, all evens, all blues, uh, Yahtzee style, uh, a series and so on. And some are more difficult to claim than others. Yeah, it's a, so it's a simple game, but there's enough complexity to make it available to a yeah. older player. You know, again, this is a family game that's really mm -hmm. open to a wide range of uh, players. Yeah, I totally agree. Because to me, King of the Dice, I don't know if anyone out there has heard of it, but probably have heard of the game Roll For It. Now, Roll For It is another dice game that is actually fairly similar to this, where you're going to put cards out and you're trying to get patterns on D6s. Now, Roll For It is literally marketed to adults. It's meant to be a party game, whereas this game's marketed at families. Now, earlier I mentioned kids. I should be saying families because this is part of Haba's new Game Night game line. Um, and this is 
this was my first time playing it with only adults. There were no kids here. And I got to say, not only like it went over really well, not just well, like it went over really well. Uh, what I was surprised is people even dug the cartoony style of the games. Like it looks at Disney, I guess, like Disney's not the right term, but it's 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 fantasy. It's 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 very they're very happy looking, right? Like these aren't these aren't mean looking creatures, trolls and orcs. Um, I remember at least one player was actually shocked by how good the game was. And all four of us that played agreed that the actual pusher luck dice mechanics, I got to say, were better in this family game than Tower of Madness. I have to say, it's the game is, while it's a cartoon art style, the feeling of the characters reminds me almost of like a Pixar-ish okay. thing. Not, not, in, not in style, but just in, the, in that sort of emotional expression of the characters. It's, it's, it's cute, but again, it's not kidsy cute. You know, it's not My Little Pony yeah, cute. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, it's got a nice, it's got a nice feel to it that way. Uh, and also, interestingly enough, uh, King of the Dice is actually rated uh, by the community as a higher starting age group than Roll for It. See, that's weird because well, they said Roll for It's marketed at adults. Yeah. I play it with my kids; we own it. That's why we bought it. And uh, the reason I picked up King of the Dice was because my kids liked Roll for It, and I thought this was a better implementation of a very similar mechanic. Now, I only played King of the Dice once, but I left the game set up. Now, that's a t tip, right? If you're running public events, leave games set up. So when people walk in, they're like, oh, what's this? And then you can walk over and go, oh, you want to learn it? Leave a game set up. So I left it set up. Later in the night, uh, one of the players I taught, because this is how simple the game is, I noticed was teaching a full group of players who showed up later, which is awesome. And then I checked in with them. I'm like, hey, how'd it go? And everyone's like, oh, this is a really good game. I really like this game. And again, adults. Um, and yes, they serve adult beverages, but this wasn't like a big drinking thing. This, this isn't a game where the alcohol is going to improve it or, or make it worse for that matter. This was like sober adults were enjoying the game. I got to say, I, I think, uh, if I, if things had happened in other words, this podcast had come before last week's podcast, King of the Dice totally would have been on my list of modern gateway games. You know, it's interesting. Uh, it, in, in some ways, one of the ways I feel like I might describe now, again, I haven't played this one yet, but uh, Yahtzee meets Card Kingdoms of Valeria is sort of the, the feel I get I, I uh, guess. seeing it. That's all. There's some good pusher luck. There's some strategy to it. It's not just random. Now, I do have to admit, when I, I don't know if people remember it, but I have talked about this game before we played with Deanna, and Deanna was not a fan. She wants more control over her own destiny. She felt the game was too random. But it's a dice game, and it's a Yahtzee-based dice game. Like, it's it's a dice game with three re-rolls. I, I just have a feeling she doesn't like, she hates roll for it. So I think that she might have thought it was slightly better. Now, speaking of last week's topic and gateway games, one of the games we talked about last week was Lotus from Play Ren or from Renegade Game Studios. Um, I was talking about it last week, and I got to say, like I said, I pretty much just took the pile we talked about last week and brought it to easy mode. Lotus was in that pile. Now, I did sit down and play it with four players, but this wasn't gateway game for those players. I was playing with established gamers. gamers. To be honest, it was Deanna, Tori, and Kat. So I'm not, I didn't get to if it was a good gateway game. Uh, but it was the first time playing for Deanna, Tori, and Kat. And I think it went over pretty well. The one issue, though, is kind of what I just alluded to a minute ago, is easy mode serves adult beverages. And one of the players may have been past the point of learning any new game at that point. Well, and this is a concern, no matter what the game you play is, folks, please, if you're going to be at public events, know your limits. Yeah, this, this wasn't bad. It didn't get to a bad place, but uh, you know what? We should have stopped the game because partway through the game, the person was like, you know, I should go home. And we should have just went, you know, let's wrap the game. That's actually my bad. Thinking, thinking about it in retrospect, we should have just ended it where we were. Um, I got to say, though, despite this, like we did play a full game and that player was just kind of checked out. I it's still Lotus is good. Uh, I gotta admit, it had been a couple years since I played it, and since we and I recommended it on the episode, and I'm recommending it from nostalgia's sake. And it was nice to sit down and play it, and like talking about last week's what got me hyped about it, and it didn't disappoint. But now I do realize that when I was describing the scoring last week, wow, I was off. Um, well, I guess a bit off. I told him scoring when I talked about it last week. So just to correct what I said last week, so in Lotus you're building flowers. Each turn, you can play two petals, cycle the cards in your deck, or play a guardian, which are these cute little insect meeple. The various flowers each have a different number of petals, and I think there's five different types of flowers. Now, the way the scoring actually works is that when a flower is completed, the person who completes the flower, puts the last petal on, gets all the cards, and each of those is worth one point each. 
Now, the player who has area majority on that flower, which is based on their guardian marker, plus the card symbols that are on the cards when you play your cards, they have your color on them, they either get five points or get that get a special power. Now, there's three special powers. One lets you play three or more petals in a turn instead of two. Another lets you hold more cards, five, in, or five instead of four. And the last unlocks a special elder guardian, which is like a silver meeple, and it counts as two guardians. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's one of those games where I think uh, it's a filler, so it doesn't need to be yep. that super meaty. Uh, and people seem to just generally either like it if they like fillers or not like mm -hmm. it much. What I found interesting is the game has such a sort of singular artistic vision to it. And mm -hmm. yet when I look, it has two artists listed on the uh, on the box, which surprised the heck out of me because to, to find something that sort of singular in its design concept with two artists is... Uh, I'm going to guess one artist designed the back of the cards and the symbols, like the iconography on the cards and the other did the petals. Ah, uh, okay. That That's that, that's a pure guess, but the, there are two distinct things going on, right? You've got the, the mechanics on the cards and then the art on the cards. Right. No, that makes sense. Now, except for the fact that we had one player who had a bit of difficulty grasping the nuances of the game, uh, our single play went well. Uh, I'm going to keep this one in rotation for a while. Um, Deanna is even saying in the chat right now, we should remember to the, bring this to the Extra Life event on Saturday, and I think it's great. I think this is the perfect weight and style of game for easy mode and for getting non-gamers to play or new gamers to play. Uh, it's got that thinky filler level. Like, it, there's enough there that there's some meat and it's quick to teach and light and plus everyone gets the the concept right you're building flowers it's it's not a hard to approach theme yeah no i think the scoring is really the only thing that gets yeah, a, little a little wonky on it but uh the play the gameplay itself up until that scoring point uh is pretty straightforward so that was all i played on saturday but man it, i wouldn't say it was packed but it was our busiest night at easy mode yet and there were a ton of other games that got played. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to talk about them or not, but I did teach a bunch of games. Like one that I didn't play in was a four player game of Terraforming Mars, which was kind of funny. So these four new people I've never seen before show up. They walk over, we have, I talked about this before, where you have a central table where all the games are available for people to play. And they're looking at them and I was currently playing King of the Dice. And I'm like, hey, you guys gotta excuse me. I gotta go check in with these guys. I gotta, I gotta play host. Uh, so there's another one of our tips is make sure you have a host at these events and don't expect to play games. And if you do tell the people you're playing with, you may need to take care of hosting. So I go over and I'm like, Hey, are these any games you guys want to play? And they're like, Oh, terraforming Mars. And I was just like, just for a second, like, I'm, I probably turned white. Right. I'm like, brand new gamers want to play terraforming Mars. Okay. I'm like, you guys, sorry, you people, do you realize, I don't remember what I actually said in person, try not to use guys, you folk. Do you, do you people realize that you picked the most complicated game on that table? Not that Terraforming Mars is hugely complicated, but for what I brought to easy mode, it was by far the most complicated game. They're like, oh, we know. And I'm like, oh, so you're familiar with Terraforming Mars? Like, oh, yeah, we watch Watch It Played videos. We've read the rule book. We just don't own it. We just want to check it out. I'm like, oh, okay, this I'm okay with. <laughs> so I sat them down. I helped them set up the game, and I taught them how to play, and it actually went really well. Uh, I It threw me off. Um other games I saw played, uh, Modern Art by Rainier Nitzia, which is a game I've never played. It's one he's famous for, so that looked really good. Uh, Roger is a gentleman who just started coming out to events at CG Realm recently, and he's a local game designer. He's got a slew of games he's designed himself, and I saw him showing off a couple of his games. Uh, at the time, I was playing Tower, or watching Tower of Madness, so I didn't get to try them. Uh, so that was cool to see. Uh, there was a group playing Elder Sign, which is Yahtzee Cthulhu, which I thought was really funny after Tower of Madness, but that's a cooperative game. Um, I brought Sagrada and Go Cuckoo, and both of them got played at some point. I didn't teach them. People who I teach previously taught them, which I think Sean Hamilton might have taught both of them. Oh, Deanna taught Go Cuckoo. So there you go. Deanna taught a dexterity game. <laughs> um, so again, Go Cuckoo, everyone. I don't get it. I, everyone loves that game. Uh, Deanna tried out a game called Siberia that I got to say looks really good. She strongly recommended that as a really involved game that played in a very short amount of time. So like there were a lot. It felt like a heavy Euro in a short space. So that sounds cool. Um, seems to be out of print, though. So I don't know if we'll be able to find a copy of that. Um, I even brought Zantico, right? Because I figured, hey, I'll show off the game and be like, hey, if you want to get a copy, you can go and enter the giveaway. And that got played by a group of three players. And I got to say, they seem to like it. Roger in particular, the game designer guy, was really fascinated by the three-player game well and three seems to be the sweep spot on that one yeah. i think we've kind of determined that that's where it sits best yeah i definitely agree i i 
almost say don't play it too. <laughs> but overall, it's great. Uh, great event. We continue to get more people out each month. Uh, and I got to say, I love seeing the new faces. That To me, that's kind of what drives me. That's what kept me running things like the Windsor Gaming Resource and, and running events like this is seeing new people out every week. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What have you got planned for the coming week? Uh, well, uh, we're talking maybe a couple days from now, some three-player sorcerer streamed instead of Gloomhaven. Uh, of course, the Extra Life warm-up events on the 24th. Uh, so there's going to be all kinds of gaming. Uh, for those of you listening on Tuesday, it's already happened. Uh, but then it's literally three weeks until our next public play event, which just seems like a long time. But it's one of those, there's a fifth Saturday this month, like a fifth weekend. And then um, another local game store has an event the first Saturday of the month, and that's not one I attend. So I'm going to have a couple weekends free. So I think what I'm going to try to do is get some more of the games I brought home from Origins played. So expect to see some more unboxing videos. Well, you won't see them on YouTube, but watch our Twitch channel. Watch your notifications because I, I got to get some more unboxings done. And I'm thinking of setting up some Saturday night events to play things like Venhos or Pulsar. Some of the bigger, heavier games that just I don't want to just show up easy mode with. And be like, hey, play this Vitalo Asorta game. You know, it's stuff that I, I basically event games. I need to schedule game nights. All right. Well, I still have some more expansions for DC that I haven't gotten around. And uh, I, again, I haven't gotten out to pick up that new one. So we'll, uh, we'll see. Maybe, uh, maybe that'll be something I pick up on the 24th when I'm down. Yeah, very true. That, that might work out. 